As you do that, please take your Bibles and turn with me to Philippians chapter 2. Philippians 2. Our text is going to be found in verses 17 and 18 today, but we're going to begin reading at verse 14 so we can get our arms. We're going to back up there so we can kind of get our arms around the whole context of this paragraph. Let me say at the outset how humbled and grateful I was at the ordination service this past Sunday. It's, it, it's been a long journey for us. I have a wonderful wife who has joyfully walked with me every step of the way. I'm so grateful for that. Um, and it was especially sweet to be installed in this church among you, um, people that we love and, and are dear to us. And so that was especially sweet for me. It was a day filled with gratitude. And so please just receive our affection and our thankfulness. Uh, and plus, the pie was amazing. So well done on that. <laughs> That was, that, was, uh, that, was, that, that was literally, it, I would say icing on the cake, but that wouldn't be appropriate for pie. <laughs> Philippians chapter 2, beginning at verse 14. This is God's perfect and his sufficient word for us today. Do all things without grumbling or disputing. That you may be blameless and innocent, children of God without blemish in the midst of a crooked and twisted generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast to the word of life so that in the day of Christ I may be proud that I did not run in vain or labor in vain. Then our text this morning. Even if I am to be poured out As a drink offering upon the sacrificial offering of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with you all. Likewise, you also should be glad and rejoice with me. May the Lord bless his word in our midst. On March 30th, 1867, the U.S. Secretary of State William H. Seward finalized a purchase He purchased the territory of Alaska from the Tsar of Russia, and it cost a whopping $7 million, which back then seemed like a ridiculously steep price to pay for what was thought as a frozen tundra. Why would you pay that? And in fact, it was so controversial that the measure itself, when it came up for a vote, it only passed by one vote. There was that many people against it. Members of Congress, they labeled it all different kinds of things. They labeled it Seward's Folly. There's other things they called it. One of the things, my, my personal favorite, was Pre- President Andrew Johnson's polar bear garden. I thought that's a great way to describe Alaska, his polar bear garden. But needless to say, even though the deal had been years in the making, there was a price for it to be completed, for it to be finished. So we want to ask the question, why was Seward, Stewart so willing to pay this price? Why was he willing to stay the course, to eagerly push forward in the midst of opposition and derision? Because he saw something that others simply didn't see. He, saw, he didn't see the price tag of this purchase so much as he saw the potential. That's what he saw. The territory was so massive that it only cost two cents an acre. But you'd have a hard time convincing folks back in Washington, D.C. that it was even worth that. It's hard to picture how this could ever be a good deal for them. The land looked desolate. You can't farm it. There's not a good growing season. There's no railroads. There's no way to access it. But while its value wasn't immediately obvious, it was in 1898 when gold was discovered in the Yukon that the rest of the U.S. began to see the beauty and worth of Alaska as well. Fur, oil, and many other natural resources soon followed as people made their way up to this new territory. And I looked it up today, the state's GDP annually is now tops $50 billion, annually, with a B. And so if everyone from the start had had known what Seward knew, there never would have been this pushback. They'd have happily agreed to the price, and they would have hoped and prayed that the Tsar of Russia never figured out what a lopsided deal this was going to turn out to be. See, the value was always there. It just took a while for people to appreciate that that price was worth it. Well, the same thing can be true for us as Christians. We miss seeing the treasure a lot of times that's hiding in plain sight. And when we do, the price that we're willing to pay for that treasure begins to drop significantly. What we're willing 
to go through. You see, it's the perceived value of something that determines the price that we're happily willing to pay for it. That's always the case. It's the perceived value of something that determines the price, and here's the key, that we're happily willing to pay for it. In our text this morning, Paul is talking about being willing to happily pay a price. Even if it's not immediately obvious to everybody else, here's the reason why. He's, he's telling them, for those who stick it out, for those who see the course to the end, this is a transaction that you're going to be thrilled that you made. That's what he's saying this morning. Verses 17 and 18, they break down into two natural points. So there's two verses, two points. That's going to be our flow today. The first point is the price that Paul is willing to happily pay. That's going to be in verse 17. And the second is the call to happily pay the same. That's in verse 18. So those are our two points. Let's look at that first point there in verse 17. Right out of the gate, we see that Paul is clear. There is a price to be paid. In fact, he paints a very vivid picture of the suffering that they're experiencing. But he also expresses joy in the midst of that suffering. That in itself is going to challenge a lot of what we hear and think about happiness today. A lot of times you don't have to scroll through many to posts to find experts talking about how you're to be happy and how to pursue happiness. But overwhelmingly, happiness in those, in those arenas is being talked about and defined in terms of getting the stuff that you want, becoming the best version of yourself, or finding true love. You change your circumstances somehow, and you find your happiness. That's how it's defined. Better circumstances can be a good thing. And if they come our way, we want to thank the Lord for those. But the problem with this line of thinking is that those things aren't built, ultimately, to carry the weight of our joy. Something as important as our joy, those things aren't built to carry the weight of that. We need something that's much, much greater. Paul's consistently talking about blessings and happiness, too. And in fact, we, we've heard about this. The, the book of Philippians is so filled with this topic, that that's considered the main theme of the book, joy. But, but as he talks about it, it begins to emerge that when he's talking about happiness, he's talking about happiness differently than how we normally think about happiness. Paul is not, his line of thinking, his happiness is not, it's not a happiness in the absence of a cost. Paul's happiness is a happiness in spite of a cost. That's the happiness that we see here. And unlike a lot of what is written today, this is not just a theory that Paul's dealing with. He's not just kicking it around, think, trying it out, thinking maybe this will work. Maybe this will help smooth things out in life. Through no fault of his own, trouble is currently surrounding him as he writes this. These are not happy days as we would define them. They're not happy days for him. They're not happy days for the readers who receive this letter. As you probably know, Paul's in jail in Rome and the reason he's there is he's been unjustly accused on account of his preaching. And he's been in prison long enough that all of Caesar's guard knows why he's there, so he's been there for a while. He's not sure what a day may hold. He's not sure when this might end. Plus, he's increasingly concerned about the churches that he planted and has cared for for his whole life for, for, since his conversion. He's been gone a long time, and he's concerned about that. Not only that, the Philippians have their own set of troubles. They were storm clouds that are starting to form on the horizon in Philippi. This is a pagan city. And animosity towards the gospel was growing, especially towards Christians who confessed that Jesus alone was Lord. It's one thing to adopt Jesus and kind of still hang on to your old way of life. It's quite another thing to begin to be extreme and start talking about him as the only way. And that people are sinful and need to repent and be reconciled to God. So even though there doesn't seem to be formal persecution here in this city just yet, opposition to the gospel is obviously strong enough that he's having to encourage them. He's already encouraged them once that they need to not be frightened. He's exhorted them not to be frightened in anything by their opponents. So the opposition is strong enough for that. It's, it's obvious that the cost of following Christ and striving for the gospel was going up every day in this city. And so this is not the time or place. This is not the setting that you would normally think that you'd be talking about happiness. This is not the place that, you would, that it would immediately come to mind. But look at the opening phrase in verse 17. That's about as strong a statement as you can make. 
You see that there? It says some transactions have, translations have it even if, but you could also translate it but even if. It's a, it's a strong, it's filled with emphasis. It's an emphatic opening. Paul is not uninformed about what he's facing and what they are facing. But even if that's the road they're called to, mo- to walk down, he's going to be undeterred. That's what he's saying here. He's going to walk down it happily. It's not going to stop me from walking down it happily. Some commentators think that he may be referencing his future martyrdom, martyrdom when he talks about what it means to be poured out, but that's unlikely for several reasons. First of all, he's already declared in chapter 1 that to depart and to be with Christ is better by far than to remain here in the flesh. So that's the best thing that he can imagine. And if he was talking about that, it would be hard to see how the even if statement makes as much sense if that were the case. Also, the verb that he uses for being poured out is in the present tense. This is something that he's currently going through. He's currently, presently being poured out. So for those two reasons, he probably isn't talking about a future one-time event only, although it probably does include that event. But maybe, maybe the most convincing reason for understanding this reference as current suffering is that for Paul, there's a direct link between his chains, his current chains, and the persecution that this church is experiencing. Paul recognized that in the providence of God, they had been called to share a common faith. But along with that, they were also called to share in a common suffering on account of that faith. And so he uses here a shocking image to help them feel this connection for themselves. He references the daily sacrifices that the Levitical priests were commanded to offer up when the sacrificial system was initially set up in Exodus. And the daily sacrifices in particular were never offered alone. They always included several different elements were included in these daily sacrifices, and they were brought together for a complementary purpose. That's what he's referencing here. Now, this church was primarily, Philippi Philippi was primarily made up of Gentiles, and so he's probably already explained the meaning of these elements being combined. And as a result, he has a reason to think that they understand what he means when he uses this image. But for those of us who are a little bit further removed, it helps us to know a little background about these daily sacrifices as well. One pastor describes it this way. The drink offering refers to the topping off of an ancient animal sacrifice. The offerer poured wine either in front of or on top of the burning animal, and the wine would be vaporized. That steam symbolized the rising of the offering to the deity for whom the sacrifice was made. Paul viewed his entire life as a drink offering. And here, here it was poured on the Philippians sacrificial service. So we, got, we see that God intends right here from the get-go that it is this intimate connection between the animal sacrifice and the wine that was poured out on top of it. Either one of those things would have been incomplete without the other elements. They would have been lacking. But in this case, these things go together. They complement one another. Now, we want to be clear, Paul isn't claiming that if you combine his suffering and the suffering that they were going through, that somehow that would earn favor, earn God's favor. That was a sacrifice that would earn God's favor. That's not what he's talking about here. Jesus alone is the pleasing, all-sufficient, wrath-satisfying sacrifice. They, all of their combined suffering couldn't atone for a single sin. That's not what he's saying here. Nothing they do or don't do could add to what Jesus has already done. But what he is saying is that now, Now that they are in Christ, it's precisely that union that has brought them into a common suffering. It's precisely that union. So even though the threats that they're facing have different faces, and they come from different places, these things are not isolated from one another. That's key. That's key to understanding. In the wisdom of God, their suffering is not a carbon copy. It's not the exact same. But that allows the different things that they're going through to complement one another in this sacrifice. Listen, no suffering, no suffering for the sake of the gospel is redundant. There's, 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 not, there's not a single thing that we face as Christians for the sake of the gospel 
that's pointless. It's not. There's not an extra. There's not gonna, we're not going to get to heaven and find there was extras left over. There weren't, oh, somebody else went through that, therefore we didn't need yours anymore. That's not the case. In the wisdom of God, each one is a unique aroma. Each one is, contributes somehow, complements somehow this pleasing sacrifice, and each one is accomplishing something that only it could. The pains that you're going through, the suffering that you walk through, it's, only, it's accomplishing something that only that could. It's a complementary suffering. And so there's a price to be paid. All those who are in Christ belong to a fellowship of suffering saints. But make no mistake, and make no mistake, we follow a crucified Messiah. We bear the name, Christians, of a crucified Messiah. We can lose the shock of that along the way. But Paul knew this to be the case more than any other Christian. And in the midst of that, in the midst of that, he's not only seeing the hard, though. He's not only seeing the hard. He wants to acknowledge it, yes. He wants, it, he wants us to understand it, yes. But that's not the message that he's intending to leave with the Philippians. Instead, I love this, instead, he sees happiness. He sees happiness abounding. He sees a price that he's happily willing to pay. That's what he's intending to, to convey to them in this letter. And it begs the question of why. It's one thing to grind it out when we face the real trials. It's another thing to not really know what we're getting into. We don't, we don't really know what's at stake. But it's another thing altogether to fully understand the cost and then still gladly move forward, to still gladly step in. So what does Paul know? What does he know? Why does, why does he see something that's obvious that may not be obvious to the Philippians and may not be as obvious to us? What's, what's he getting at? Well, ultimately, the secret that Paul grasps is this, Jesus, knowing Jesus Christ is the greatest joy you can ever have. He's going to talk about that in chapter 3. But one of the expressions of that, one of the outworkings of that relationship and of the gospel and the gospel story and the joy that we have in that. One of the outworkings of that is fruit. It's fruit. And here's what Paul knew. Gospel fruit is more precious than any of us realize. Gospel fruit is more precious than any of us realize. Paul sees the worth of it, and so that's what he's after no matter the cost. Because gospel fruit is infinitely more valuable than anything he's ever going to give up. He had a clear idea of what he was looking for. He wanted to see it happen. What he was giving his life to. What he was being poured out to see happen. And, and, and it, it, it had tangible fruit that he could see. He wanted to see the people of God progressing in their sanctification. Especially as it meant relating to one another. That was one of the things, the fruits that he was looking for. And he also is longing for the gospel to make progress in areas where it hasn't before and to be preached so that people are saved. That's the other fruit that he wants to see. This is tangible gospel fruit. And he's searching for this every time. When he sends a letter out, when he's in prison and he sends a letter out or he gets a report back, you know what he's listening for? That. That fruit. He's desiring to see that happen. That's what he's after. So what excites him, when he gets that, it, it brings him joy because he knows the worth of that. And it's, in fact, it's the value. It's the value of that fruit that's determining the price, even at that moment, that he's willing to pay for them. It's the value of that fruit that he's saying, even if, for your sake, that makes me happy. That makes me glad. It's in the same way that we need to catch a glimpse of how precious this fruit, this gospel fruit, tangible fruit, actually is. We can't trust our own estimation of it. We can't trust our own valuation of it. We're not good, we're not good at, at figuring out what it's worth. We have to have a different measuring stick than our own. Here's the one we have to use. If Jesus thought that gospel fruit was valuable enough to joyfully endure the cross. 
the net has to be what defines it for us. It defines the worth for us. It's already set. We don't decide it. We receive it. Okay? If Jesus thought that gospel fruit was valuable enough to joyfully endure the cross, then the price has already been set. The value has already been set, and it's infinite. It increases in our eyes how we see it. Gospel fruit is precious. And this is a harvest that's going to last. So often we willingly sacrifice. We happily devote our time to things that are temporary. But the minute that we achieve them, the joys that they bring are already starting to slip through our fingers, aren't they? So one song I recently heard puts it, all the good things go away. Oh, that was a great summary. All the good things go away. That's from the world's perspective. But this harvest, this gospel fruit, this is a bounty that's always going to be going up. It's always going to be increasing. It's never going to take a dip. And it's worth being excited about. Here's why. Because present gospel fruit, present gospel fruit, current gospel fruit is leading towards future glory. It's headed somewhere. Present gospel fruit is headed somewhere. It's leading to future glory. Paul certainly understood that, and so it makes him smile. It made him smile even in the face of everything that was temporarily against him, even in the face of these unjust accusations, and that's why he says, I will rejoice, and I will rejoice alongside all of you. Every time, listen, every time somebody chooses to not act out of selfish ambition, but instead consider another one more significant than themselves. Paul says, I'm celebrating that because the mind of Christ is starting to show up in your midst. That's gospel fruit. Every time you face trials and you aren't grumbling like the Israelites in the desert did, I'm happy because you're proving to be blameless and innocent children of God in the world. Every time you are striving together for the sake of the gospel in a hostile culture, would it be a lot easier to step back and shrink back? He says, I'm going to rejoice in that. I'm going to rejoice with you. That's gospel fruit. Paul sees these things starting to happen, and he's eager to dive in. He's eager to, to play a part. I want to be in on that. I want to see that happen. I want to see it continue to increase and grow in your midst. But the question comes to mind, is this something that's meant for Paul only? Certainly he has a unique authority, he had an influential role that none of us are ever going to have, and that, that was a blessing. But he does believe that we all have a major part to play in this, in gospel fruit. All of us are to have the experience, that same experience of sacrificial joy. It's for the whole church. We see that in the second point of our text this morning. It's this call to happily pay the same. It's found in verse 18. Look at that verse with me. <clears throat> Likewise, you also should be glad and rejoice with me. We see a major switch that happens here. Transitions from the previous verse. He goes from talking about his own joy, and then he shifts gears, and he starts talking about their joy. And what's startling is that he doesn't just encourage them to rejoice. He's not saying, hey, guys, it'd be great if you rejoice. We're often encouraged, we are encouraging one another to do that. That's not what he's saying here. Instead, he's commanding them to rejoice. Not only that, but he's, he's telling them to rejoice in the same way that he rejoices. He's telling them to re rejoice in the same even-if way that he rejoices. We can sort of gloss this over at first glance, but if you stop and think about it, this is really an astounding sentence to read. It's life-altering sentence. He turns from his own joy in the midst of suffering, and then he sets that expectation. He sets an expectation that they too should be happy. To be happy even as they face trials of their own. It's a remarkable reversal of how we normally think and feel. It's a massive reversal. It's a 180. But it's a reversal that's meant to characterize the church. This is normal Christian living. You also should rejoice. It's directed. It's directed at all of us this morning. Charles Spurgeon, the great 19th century preacher, he puts it in these terms. 
He says, I do not think the church rejoices enough. We all grumble enough and groan enough, but very few of us rejoice enough. That's what Paul's getting at here. That's what he's after. He intends to see an army of people that are raised up in Philippi where this reversal has happened, that they are rejoicing in the exact same way that he does. That's what he wants. We often tell our children around our house that obedience is obeying right away, all the way, and they can, finish this, they can usually finish it with a happy heart. That's, that's how it goes. We, we, I had that conversation recently, this morning, with a happy heart. That's what we're after. If you're stomping off to brush your teeth, or if you're grudgingly sharing with your brother or sister, that's not what we're after. The same way joy, joy is an essential part of Christian obedience. It's an, it's an expectation in the household of saints. And this is not a new command. It's not a one-off. We see it repeatedly throughout Scripture. God desires happy servants. At the same time, this is not flattening out our experiences. It's not flattening them out. This isn't like the movie Inside Out where joy just tries to get rid of sadness because if sadness is there at all, then, then, then joy can't be there. That's not what this is doing. It's not flattening it out. Paul is not minimizing our pain here. There's always a dichotomy that's at work in this life. He describes it elsewhere as sorrowful, yet always rejoicing. On the one hand, we're absolutely meant to feel sorrow. When we face suffering or, or we see someone else experiencing suffering, and we're called to try and alleviate that and to seek the Lord for grace in that. But that's why immediate circumstances can't be the deciding factors in our joy. If they are, then that joy is going to soon be gone. Paul's saying here, if our joy is based on what Christ is accomplishing in and through the church, then that joy, that's the kind of overcoming even if joy that I'm talking about. It runs deeper. It's a joy that makes that cost worthwhile. Likewise, you also should be glad and rejoice with me. It seems simple. It's a simple sentence. But a lot, a lot is at stake in that command. And it's a command that we're called to happily obey. Now, I know most of us here would agree with this in principle. It's not hard to understand what he's getting at. But it could be a whole lot harder to actually feel this way. And that's especially true when this gospel fruit that we're called to bear begins to include a, a personal cost. It's easy to start thinking that these two things are mutually exclusive. I can have joy, I can be happy, or I can be involved in this mess of a process. That they're mutually exclusive. I get to pick one or the other. And the way that we normally resolve that conflict in our minds as it comes, we have to pick between them. The way we try to resolve it, I know gospel fruit is needed, and I know it's costly. You know, I resolve that. Hopefully somebody else. Hopefully somebody else is going to step in and pick up this tab. That's how oftentimes our mind tries to resolve that tension. So how do we personally work towards both? How do we work towards both? How do we battle for that kind of overcoming joy when we'd much rather just not have to deal with the cost? So let's spend some time here. In order to actually obey this command, to actually be able to say, even if, this is where the struggle happens. Even if can sound a lot easier when it's generic. It gets a whole lot harder when you start talking about specifics. Even if that critical comment comes when you've worked so hard to serve. Even if somebody goes behind your back. Even if it gets awkward when you try to bridge the gap and speak the gospel. Even if it isn't convenient. Even when 
even if it hurts deeply, even if it's behind the scenes. Paul says, even if I am to be poured out. Those things, those things are a lot harder to say. So what do we do? Where do we go when it feels like the price is starting to get too high? Gospel fruit feels like maybe it's not worth it. In those moments, it's often the case that the greatest need that we have is not for better circumstances. Oftentimes, our greatest need in that situation is to see the beauty of what God's up to. Because that's the only thing, listen, that's the only thing that's going to make this worthwhile. It's the only thing that will keep us there in joy. And so there's a couple of practical things that we maybe can do to help expand this thinking, to help us feel that. First, first, I suggest that we stop envisioning Christian suffering and joy as merely an individual thing. Notice that I said Christian suffering because we have assurances from Scripture that God is intimately at work. He's intimately at work in the sufferings and the trials of our individual lives. And yes, we do have unique callings. We're, we're sent to different places with different trials and different challenges for the sake of the gospel. But in the life of the church, in the life of the church, those things are not disconnected from each other. Physically, it feels that way, right? Because we're not in the same place a lot of times when we face them. But think, Paul's in jail and they're in Philippi. But they're not disconnected, even though it feels that way. They're, they're working together in God's economy. And so it helps to zoom out here. This image of a daily offering, a drink offering being poured out on top of an animal sacrifice helps us to put this kind of suffering, Christian suffering, into a community setting, into a complementary setting. And it's a holy thing for us to walk through, the, through suffering together. That's a holy thing that we get to do together. That's a big part of what we're doing when we link arms in church membership. That's a big aspect of what we're doing. We're sharing a common faith, a common confession but we're also agreeing to share in the cost together. That's why oftentimes comparing our sufferings to the sufferings of others is not always helpful because it's going to isolate us when we most need to see that God is up to something much greater in our midst and He intends to use the hurts that we're currently going through as a powerful, powerful compliment in what He's up to. So we want to see our suffering in, in the context of the community. In the same way, we want our joy to be a common joy. It's a lot of what we're doing when we engage emotionally on a Sunday morning. While we're singing, this is, it's a chance for us to engage personally with the Lord, absolutely. But it's also a wonderful expression of our common joy. We're consciously rejoicing that no matter how far south the week has gone, that we didn't expect that we are rejoicing in Jesus Christ, and at the same time, we're mutually calling our brothers and sisters to rejoice in that common joy alongside of us. That's what we're doing. Personal joy is a good thing. But if personal joy is all we ever experience, then oftentimes that's going to begin to quickly turn inward. It's going to be more based on how I feel about my circumstances. Joy that's experienced in the body is going to be inherently more outward focused. Joy in the body is going to be more others focused. It's less a part of what is going on inside of me and more about what I'm a part of. That's what joy in the body does. So we want this image of the daily sacrifice to, to stay in our heads. We want to be able to think through it this way, to increasingly think of suffering as mutual suffering with one another. When another person walks through it, for us to think of it in terms of that as well for the sake of the gospel. But even more so, this command for all of us together to rejoice. Let this command move us towards mutual rejoicing, rejoicing with brothers and sisters. So that's the first way that we can begin to change our thinking in this area. But second, this flows directly out of the first application. We want to celebrate. We want to celebrate gospel fruit that's happening all around us. In fact, I would encourage all of us to make this a regular habit of our, of our spiritual, our corporate spiritual disciplines together. Whether it's in conversion or it's in sanctification, it's, in, it's important for us to celebrate that and to consider what gospel fruit is pointing towards. 
Listen, it's pointing back to a risen Savior, yes. But it's also pointing forward. And it's pointing towards a lot of very happy things to come. We want to, we want to see gospel fruit with those lenses and be able to celebrate that. And so we have some real-life occasions that are currently happening in the life of our church to be able to do that, to be able to see this and to celebrate it and understand the value of it and the meaning of it. Next time we're sitting in small group and somebody shares about something that they've been struggling with for years maybe, over the last few months they've been praying, seeking the Lord, and they're beginning to experience some peace and joy in Christ. When they, when they say that, in that moment, grab a hold of that. Grab a hold of that. That's a joyful statement. That's a happy thing. It's a happy revelation. That's fruit. That's tangible fruit. Grab a hold of it. Don't let it slip by. Rejoice in it. And God used you somehow to be a part of that. If you're in that group, He used you to help make that happen. Maybe it was indirectly. Maybe it was directly. Maybe it was conscious. Maybe it wasn't. But this is fruit. This is fruit that makes it worthwhile to rush home from work and maybe miss supper in order to be there, to sit with folks that you didn't know not that long ago. This is worthwhile. And in that, we rejoice. We have a baptismal that's coming up in a few weeks, and what a chance to remember afresh the joy of our own salvation. But it's also another chance to celebrate that salvation in the life of another precious soul. I encourage you, sometime over the next few weeks, it's in two weeks, to set aside a few minutes just to read and pray through Romans 6 and see what that means for that person. The value of that. This is a wonderful opportunity that we have as a church to obey this command. Baptisms are happy reminders. They're happy reminders that the price is worth it. When we continue to patiently and even sometimes self-consciously open our mouths to share the gospel, to talk about sin and the grace that we find in Jesus Christ, this is the kind of fruit that we're looking for. This is the fruit that makes it worthwhile. This is the fruit that we want to celebrate. In this, we will rejoice. We participate in a partnership of churches. And that partnership exists to plant and to strengthen churches all over the world for the glory of God. Sovereign Grace Churches exists for that. And that partnership is worth it for us. It's worth it for us to happily sacrifice to be a part of that partnership. As a church, we give part of our annual budget towards seeing this gospel advance and towards this partnership go forward. That means giving that you guys sacrificially gave. That money that you guys sacrificially parted with went towards this effort. And we consider it a joy to be able to make that sacrifice. Likewise, many of you have happily gone, spent time overseas, and one of these trips has gone to help strengthen partners in sovereign grace. You've, you've given of your own resources. You've connected directly with these church planters. You've prayed for them personally. As we do those things, when we, every time we hear a report back of names and faces and people and places, the, the gospel is going forward. We're reminded again, oh yeah, oh yeah, it is worth it. It is worth it to pay that price. And in that, we will rejoice together. Paul was seeing these exact kinds of things. These kinds of things, the things that go on in the life of a local church. That's what he was seeing. And he was seeing the gospel shining through each and every one of them. And that made him smile, made it worthwhile for him. Somewhere between conversion and glory. The sight of those things, they can start to become dull or blurry. Instead of a rich bounty, we increasingly could see them possibly as a barren or costly wasteland. And that's why we need to, to cultivate, to cultivate this practice of celebrating afresh the work of God in our midst. Listen, it helps the colors of grace to begin to pop again. It helps us to see the value that's right there in front of us. We want to celebrate well. So those are, those are two practical things that can serve the cause of joy in our souls. And odds are this probably isn't going to be a switch that's just going to flip and immediately we'll, we'll be able to 
experience it in this bliss against all odds. Sometimes it sounds odd that we, we talk about we should be working towards joy. That sounds like a, a, it's, counter, it's counterintuitive. But we want to be striving to obey this. This is a command. You also rejoice. And as we look to the Lord, we follow this Savior. The joy that is to come. Paul saw that day. He saw it. He talked about it. We, we read it. He talked about it. And that, that day, it's not going to be in vain. It's not going to have run in vain. We're not going to labor in vain. We're, we're afraid, baby, that the sacrifice and the cost somehow may not turn out to be worth it. Paul's saying no on that day. It's not going to be in vain. It's not going to be in vain. It's going to be worth it. So here again, the words of a man who's in chains looking to that day. Even if I am to be poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrificial offering of your faith, I am glad and rejoice with you all. Likewise, you also should be glad and rejoice with me. Let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you that you have made a way that we can be forgiven stand right before you through nothing that we did. You knew what we needed before we were born. Without any grudging, you gave us your son. And Jesus, you came, you walked a life of cost every day, sacrificing. In the end, we, you were the one who was unjustly accused who unjustly had to pay the infinite cost and yet you did it for the joy that was set before you and you you satisfied what we deserved Lord we thank you that we get to be a part of seeing that news transform lives that your spirit is now with us He's at work in and through us. And we get to see gospel fruit. Lord, I pray that even in this moment, you would be changing our thoughts and our hearts as we face these costs. Lord, grant us the strength to see and to walk forward in obedience. Lord, cause us to be happy servants. We need your grace to do that. And we want to respond to you in that. Lord, grant us that. In Jesus' name we pray and for his glory. Amen.